university, they realized that uh, the phage RNA polymerase has very high fidelity and very short promoter is needed, and uh, they uh, introduced and published in uh, 1984 that just using a plasmid template and a short uh, promoter on it, then uh, providing the four basic nucleotide triphosphate, you can synthesize uh, mRNA. And uh, this was uh, very inspiring. They actually uh, uh, generated this uh, human beta interferon coding RNA. The RNA had all of the elements, which I already mentioned, the cap structure, the polyethyl. And uh, when they did this RNA, they uh, injected to the frog oocyte, and when it, these oocytes were cultured, actually in the medium, functional human interferon was produced. It was antiviral. And so this was the first time that when mRNA was synthesized in vitro in a tube, and it produced a functional protein. If you were in the laboratory in these times, you know, you get very excited and you wanted to, to move to this kind of this field. And that's what happened. Many different places, scientists get excited and they come up with different ideas. Uh, some of them used for like uh, therapeutic uh, 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 therapeutic use, like uh, vasopressin mRNA treats some kind of uh, diabetes, and uh, other scientists uh, use the mRNA to generate uh, uh, vaccine against infectious disease like influenza. And uh, later some scientists thought about to make cancer vaccine. As you can see, every year there was a one publication, so it was easy to follow the literature. And, uh, but if you try to follow these scientists later on, you realize that they did not publish, most of them did not publish later on, because there was a problem. The amount of uh, protein produced from this RNA and the short period of time, and it, everything degraded, so uh, it was not very effective, and they couldn't get grants, as I learned from them. <laughs> of course, I was enthusiastic also, so at the same time, when they started those experiments, I started myself. What happened is that I went to University of Pennsylvania in 1989, and Elliot hired me, and he was interested in uh, urocasinase receptor. We are in cardiology, and you know, the molecular biologists can be in any field. So, this uh, receptor was very uh, post-translational modified, uh, glycosylated, uh, gpi link and I don't even say how many things was modified on it, but um, to be functional, you needed all of this modification. So I suggested to Elliot, who is here today, told him that, you know, we should use mRNA for this whole research, and because he's as old as me, he, he agreed he was young and he didn't know, uh, and, and so what we did, you know, uh, I cloned the urokinase receptor, made the mRNA, and we put it into the, on the mammalian cell with life effect. And to be functional, this receptor had to be, all of this modification had to be present. And we were seeing that the receptor, the cell knew how to process, uh, the RNA translated, all of this modification was introduced by the cell, and the receptor was functional. This was the moment, it was in 1996 actually, when we realized that the mRNA will be useful for something. But I was demoted at position, from this position, because I couldn't get grant, just like the other scientists. But uh, luckily, uh, David Langer, a uh, neurosurgery uh, resident, who I met in uh, Elios lab as a student, medical student, you know, they usually in the lab, and they are the smartest guys also, always. <laughs> so that he made sure that for 17 years, neurosurgery department, I have this uh, laboratory. So I worked there 17 years, up until 10, year, uh, 10 years ago, and did all of the RNA on that work. And I did with my own hands, because as I mentioned, I couldn't get funding. So 
I uh, put the gel, cultured the bacteria, isolated the plasmid, and you know, defrosted the freezer as needed. <laughs> and so, with uh, David, because now we are in neurosurgery, we decided that you know we will develop some mRNA therapy for. Uh, treating stroke patient, and we synthesize different kind of RNA, nitric oxide synthase, coding RNA, and different RNA which has uh, antioxidant, uh, the coded protein has antioxidant effect. And we could show on cultured cells that is all uh, really functional, but um, we had difficulties in the animal experiments. And, uh, Eventually, we did a good improvement on the technology and also delivered to the brain, and we could see translation. And it was about 1997. As was mentioned, I met Drew Westman at the copy machine. That is true, and the part that, you know, we wrestled and fight, that was not true. It was a made-up story. We were very friendly, and uh, we agreed that we will work together. Drew was interested in uh, developing HIV uh, therapeutic or uh, uh, prophylactic vaccine. And uh, he just arrived from uh, Fauci's lab, and and that was his goal. And, you know, I just said, you know, okay, I, I do the RNA. And he said that he has these dendritic cells, which I didn't know at that time what it is, but I learned immunology from him. And, and then he tested out. And uh, uh, we together, you know, realized that this mRNA will be a very good vaccine and activated this human dendritic cells. We did some more studies and realizing that the mRNA induced uh, TNF-alpha, an inflammatory molecule. And uh, True was not bothered by that, but me, yes, because I want to develop mRNA for stroke treatment, and that would be the last kind of molecule I want to give to any patient who, which would induce inflammation. So that was when we decided that we have to understand why the mRNA is inflammatory. We have uh, mRNA in all of our cells, and we, are, we don't have inflammation. And uh, we thought that maybe because we are adding to the immune cell from outside this RNA, and that is the reason. Or maybe Drew thought that maybe I'm not making the same kind of RNA which is inside the cell. But anyway, we agreed that we will isolate RNA from different compartment of the cell, and then we will deliver to, to this uh, dendritic cells, this professional antigen presenter cell, and see whether they are inducing TNF alpha, whether they are inflammatory. So that's what we did. We isolated RNA. The purple bar shows that uh, the RNA, which I made in vitro in a tube, and the blue bars shows those inflammatory response, those, uh, cell, those RNA isolated from mammalian cells, and, and from bacteria, it is in red. So we could see that it was the RNA I produced was the most inflammatory, but others were less. And uh, when we looked at closer, we could find that tRNA, the transfer RNA, was not inflammatory at all. Hmm. So we try to understand why. I don't have that much time to f how many things we thought, but one of the important things was that the uh, transfer RNA is enriched in modified nucleosides. So this gave the idea that maybe nucleoside modification is the reason why the RNA is uh, not inflammatory. So when we replotted this bar graph, we can see some correlation. The RNA, which I synthesized, had no modified nucleosides, so that was the most inflammatory, and the, those which had the most modification, that was not inflammatory at all. Yep, we thought that we just have to somehow introduce modification to our RNA and prove it. So when we looked at there, which modification we should do. 
we have more than 100 modifications, and in our body, all of this RNA is made by basic four nucleotides, and post-transcriptionally or co-transcriptionally, they are changed by enzymes. But those enzymes which introduce these changes, not even known. So we couldn't order from Promega. Then we have to think, what should we do? We have to make the RNA in a different way. We have to order maybe uh, nucleoside triphosphate, which contains uh, nucleoside which already modified. And then cross our fingers that the RNA polymerase will incorporate and takes as a template, uh, as, as a substrate. So that's what we did. We ordered these uh, nucleoside triphosphate. We did order these because they are present in the human body. And we did not want to do any kind of uh, nucleoside modified nucleoside, which is not uh, present in human cells. We were lucky because from the 10 different nucleoside triphosphate, uh, five of them incorporated and we could make mRNA. So we were excited to test out whether the idea is true, whether these modified nucleoside containing mRNA is inducing inflammation or not. For that one, we did use isolated uh, human dendritic cells, and when we tested out, we found that uh, some of them still induce tnf alpha, this inflammatory molecule, molecule, where some of them were not uh, inducing anything. When we look at closer, we found that whenever uridine was modified, whether it was pseudouridine, tutiouridine, or 5-methyl-uridine, then the RNA was not inflammatory. So we realized that somehow nature selected uridine to recognize as an inflammatory molecule from in an RNA which is coming from outside to an immune cells. So we published this in Immunity and uh, were very excited, but obviously, both of us wanted to have an RNA which codes for a protein. So we had to test out how it is translated. Not all of them, two thiouridine, for example, is not uh, containing RNA was not translated, but uh, surprisingly, pseudouridine containing RNA translated so much better than the conventional uridine containing RNA. I will tell you about, you know, that two, three years we spent to figure out why. But uh, here we tested out different kind of uh, mRNA and looked at uh, primary cells. Like we could see that uh, delivering mRNA with lipofectin to uh, cultured uh, uh, neurons, they could pick up the RNA and translate it, and we could detect the protein. In this uh, set of experiments, we also tested out the RNA in, in vivo in animals, and we found that even in vivo, pseudouridine containing RNA translated better, and it was not inflammatory. So we reported this in uh, 2008. As I mentioned, here, of course, we found that it was so much more, uh, so mo more protein was produced, and uh, we tried to understand why. So one set of experiments, we did a co-transfection, and we realized that whatever reason, this uh, RNA, which had no uh, modification, somehow it was uh, suppressing translation. We also understand what is the molecular mechanism, because this uh, unmodified RNA actually uh, activated PKR, uh, uh, RNA-dependent protein kinase, and that's why less protein was produced. In another set of experiments, we also identified that pseudouridine containing RNA is more stable, and uh, uridine containing RNA degraded much faster. We reported these in 2010 and 2011. Of course, when we did an experiment in 2005 and used the cell line which uh, overexpressed toll like receptor 3, which responds to double studied RNA, we were bothered by this experimental result that uh, our RNA probably contains double standard RNA. And double standard RNA also inhibits translation. 
when we, uh, when we found this uh, uh, specific uh, uh, molecular um, antibody, we, uh, an antibody which could recognize uh, double-stranded RNA, we had more confirmation that really the, uh, our product, RNA product, has double-stranded RNA. I don't say to you that how much time we spent to figure out how to purify long RNA. Because as we scientists, we always face two things that we look it up and nobody did that. So we have to do it and we don't know whether it is doable. But we hope that we can uh, do and accomplish and purify the RNA. Eventually, we did develop uh, and found a condition where uh, HPLC we used to purify and get rid of the double-stranded RNA. And uh, our colleague here, Hiromi Muramatsu, was who mastering this uh, technique. What, why it was important to remove the double-stranded RNA? Our pseudouridine containing RNA induced less cytokines in uh, uh, dendritic cells, but uh, it was still induced some. And when we purified, the pseudouridine containing RNA did not induce almost any cytokines. And the uridine containing RNA also uh, induced less. So we were very excited to see whether we can see some difference in translation. And that was, was a big surprise that uh, now showing in HPLC purified RNA, when we tested out in different cells, human dendritic cells, rather, and we found that uh, it translated sometimes even thousand times more efficiently. So now that we had modified RNA, which increased the translation, we have purified RNA, so we were very happy with it. We reported this one in a nucleic acid research in 2011. So with all of this improvement, now, instead of getting a tiny amount of protein, very short period of time, now we had a lot of protein and extended time. And it seemed that messenger RNA is ready for prime time, ready to see whether in vivo in animals we can see difference. So what we did, we generated erythropoietin encoding mRNA. So, Erythropoietin is a hormone, and if you follow the bike race, you know what I am talking about. So it increased the hematocrit in animals. So what we did, we injected uh, uh, animals, the erythropoietin as a protein, and the half-life is just very short, and two hours and six hours we could detect, and it degraded. And when we had the uridine-containing RNA, it also disappeared quite quickly. But when we injected pseudouridine containing EPO mRNA to these mice, even four days later, we could detect presence of this protein in their circulation. And if you work in the nucleic acid field, you can see 0.1 microgram, how small amount is for this animal, one injection, and could uh, result such an effect. And the protein, which was produced by these animals, were functional. They increased the animal's hematocrit, and uh, when we injected weekly the mRNA, pseudouridine containing RNA, encoding erythropoietin, we could maintain for several weeks a uh, high hematocrit value. And very importantly, it was uh, not inflammatory. And uh, whilst the uridine containing uh, HPLC purified RNA did uh, induce interferon. We reported this in uh, uh, 2012. And that was again when I lost my position, and I would say that if several times I would not be terminated in my position, I wouldn't stand here. And uh, it was important, uh, and I would say that when you are having a situation, focus on what next. And what I decided that in 10 years ago, when I was terminated to, to go to BioNTech, I just learned accidentally existence of BioNTech and from another scientist who was also fired from another place. And, uh, and so, 
because BioNTech at that time didn't have that fancy building. Uh, BioNTech was just in a campus and uh, very enthusiastic people led by Özlem Türeci and Ugo Zahin. We tried to develop uh, therapy, uh, this RNA, and, and um, we did uh, many, many experiments where we further improved. We did uh, uh, codon optimization, purification, and, and many things which we already did at, uh, at the university, at the bench. We had to introduce a new, new procedure which was scalable. So we started to do uh, different kinds of work, and that, again, you didn't say me too much about vaccine, that's I leave for Drew, he's the expert. I was here also responsible for the protein replacement program. So one uh, project which I participated is to generate mRNA coding for antibodies. In this uh, specific case, it was bispecific antibodies, which uh, can mRNA was delivered to the animals which had already established large tumors, and this uh, bispecific antibody uh, recognized uh, the T cells, the immune cells, and uh, another way it also recognized the tumor specific antigen. And then it brings close proximity the tumor and the immune cells and eliminated the tumor. We did this experiment, and it entered clinical trial. We also did, uh, were not bispecific, but conventional antibody was uh, uh, generated from mRNA, and uh, it also in clinical trial. Another project I participated was uh, the, the mRNA encoded for uh, cytokines. And uh, we injected um, animals which had a cell surface closed tumor, it was uh, uh, melanoma, and uh, we converted with this cytokine mRNA, uh, led the tumor to make the protein, the cytokine, and uh, converted the cold tumor to hot tumor. And as a result of it, this, these immune cells rushed to this uh, uh, cell surface closed tumor, and then get educated, what to see and circulate it and could eliminate uh, metastatic cells. This uh, we showed here in this publication, and this uh, uh, also entered clinical trial with Sanofi. So you can ask me that why, why all of these mRNA protein based uh, mRNA based protein therapy is important. I have to say that the fastest growing uh, section of uh, medicine in these days is uh, protein based. And um, 100 years ago, you don't remember that, but 100 years ago was the first when protein was introduced as a medicine. That was insulin. And uh, uh, many different kinds of proteins were uh, isolates for cadaver and others, and it was very difficult and uh, very problematic. And 1982, when first time recombinant protein was introduced again as uh, insulin was produced by uh, uh, bacteria cells, and uh, many, many other uh, therapeutic protein is produced as a recombinant. And, uh, it is very effective, but the one problem is that it is very expensive because you have to figure out how to purify those, those proteins, and uh, that makes them unaffordable for many. So the advantage of uh, uh, using uh, mRNA instead of uh, recombinant protein is that it doesn't need purification, the mRNA is delivered to the body, and it makes uh, the protein properly folded. And you can have a multivalent uh, vaccine or multivalent uh, injection, because the RNA is always the four uh, nucleotides, and you can mix them up, because they won't stick to each other, not like a recombinant protein, which can be charged or uh, uh, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, and they can stick uh, to each other. And that made, you know, the uh, affordable, the RNA, which uh, uh, is uh, in the future. And uh, uh, my colleague, Drew, will talk about the, the future, what is in present, 
250 uh, 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 clinical trials going on uh, where mRNA is used as a therapy. And I was very glad that uh, I also could participate in this work. And I am very grateful to people who have me on my way. And of course, uh, Drew, who I work together for decades now. I was uh, spent nine years and working hard in BioNTech and very thankful to Ugo Zahin and the team. I worked 24 years at University of Pennsylvania, and uh, I am very thankful to all of those who I already mentioned. Temple University, I spent three years, and uh, I learned the basic how to be a scientist at the Biological Research Center in Seged, and uh, my teachers are here from there, and I am very grateful to University of Seged, my alma mater, where I learned the very basic one. And thank you very much for your attention. I now have the great pleasure to introduce this year's Nobel laureate in physiology and medicine, Dr. Drew Weissman. He was born in Lexington, Massachusetts. He received his MD-PhD degrees from Boston University in 1987 and did his clinical training at Beth Israel Diakonis Medical Center at Harvard Medical School. His postdoctoral work was performed at the National Institutes of Health with Dr. Anthony Fauci. He then moved to Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania in 1997, where he met Dr. Carico. <clears throat> He's the Roberts family professor in vaccine development and director of the Penn Institute of RNA Innovations. When Dr. Weisman was working late in the lab, which was so often the case, his wife was sometimes asked by her friends what her husband was doing. She then often sarcastically answered, Oh, Drew is saving the world. As it turned out, he eventually did. <laughs> Dr. Weissman, we are very much looking forward to your Nobel lecture entitled Nucleoside Modified MRNA LMP Therapeutics. Please. Thank you very much. So I need to thank so many people. Um, I'll do that throughout my entire talk, but I need to thank the Nobel Foundation, the Nobel Selection Committee, uh, and all of the scientists here for being present for these talks from Katie and I. Most of all, I have to thank Katie because Katie is the person who introduced me to RNA. I was a dendritic cell scientist from the NIH who had lots of dreams. Uh, Katie supplied the RNA, and together we made those dreams come true. 
So I wanted to start by talking about vaccines because that's where I started when I came to Penn. I had an interest in vaccines, mostly because dendritic cells, which are antigen-presenting cells, are the principal cell to target with the vaccine. So I wanted to develop ways of loading dendritic cells with a view of making better vaccines. I had every method I could think of except mRNA, and that's where I luckily met Katie at the copy machine. There are many different types of vaccine platforms, and everybody in this room has had many of these, maybe not all. Uh, they started off hundreds of years ago with live viruses, attenuated viruses. The, the first one was for by a, a physician, Edward Jenner, in England, who noticed that milkmaids were not developing smallpox. And when he looked at the cows, he noticed the cows had pox lesions that looked a lot like human smallpox. He cut open those pox lesions and injected them into people, and they were protected. That was likely the first vaccine ever developed. After that, a number of other platforms developed of inactivated viruses. Those are the influenza viruses that us old folks get. We also have protein vaccines like tetanus toxoid, viral vectors, these are the adenoviral vectors that were developed for COVID-19, and DNA and RNA. So what I wanted to talk to you about first was the nucleus-modified mRNA LNP vaccine platform. And we started this about 10 years ago, and we used a couple of model systems. The ones I'll show you now are for influenza. And we chose influenza because it's a yearly infection that sweeps the world and it changes every year, which means you have to change the vaccine. Unfortunately, it means we have to guess what next year's viruses are gonna be. And sometimes we get it right and often we don't. So influenza in the United States leads to about 30 to 60,000 deaths per year, and very large number of people get infected with the virus and are out for days to a week with symptoms. When we first started doing this work, this was the literature. These were what were reported for responses to vaccines. And vaccine manufacturers always compare to what the old vaccines did when they develop a new vaccine. So live virus, inactivated virus, and other delivery routes gave neutralization titers around one to 100. And that was considered pretty good. One to 40 is protective. But we, we took the approach, well, let's encode the hemagglutinin protein, which is the major surface protein of influenza, as an mRNA. And we immunized animals with that, and we compared that to two other types of standard vaccination. You'll see in the middle, that's an activated virus. On the left, our live virus in the nose. But the mRNA blew us away. I did this with a collaborator who ran an influenza lab. It took him a month to get these results because he kept having to repeat them and dilute them more and more. And he came storming into my office saying, what did you do to these samples? It's impossible to have a titer this high. And he was accusing me of giving him falsified samples to, to make his life miserable. I explained to him, no, that these are the real results. And, and the titers were 50 times higher than an activated virus. They were five times higher than a live virus vaccine. Typically, when you come up with a new vaccine platform, if you double the previous vaccine, biotech and pharmaceutical companies are happy. When they saw a 50-fold increase, you can imagine their joy. But as an immunologist, I wanted to understand why we were getting such enormous titers. 
So th this is a cartoon of how B cells react to viruses, antigens, vaccines, proteins, anything that's foreign. And follicular B cells recognize and pick up particles, antigens, adjuvants, and get activated. They get help from a CD4 helper cell, and they become something known as a germinal center B cell. The germinal center B cells are critical because those are the cells that rapidly proliferate, affinity mature, and produce long-lived plasma cells and memory B cells. So we set up an assay where we measured these three different types of B cells, but we did it in an antigen-specific manner. So what that means is we took HA, hemagglutinin, and protein, and fluorescinated it, and then added it to a flow cytometry panel where we could identify each of these subpopulations of cells. So we could count how many B cells in this mouse spleen or lymph node recognize the antigen in the vaccine. And we saw, not surprisingly, that for all three, there was about 50 times more antigen-specific B cells with the RNA LNP vaccine. So that explained the incredibly high titers. It didn't explain where they came from. We forgot about some mice. Actually, Norby, he's here somewhere, forgot about some mice. Uh, and we found them about 13 months later and decided, well, let, let's look and see what the, what, what's going on. So we took bone marrow out of these mice and we measured long-lived plasma cells. The long-lived plasma cells are what makes antibody that appears in your circulation. And they can be there for your lifetime. We measured antigen-specific, hemagglutinin-specific plasma cells in the bone marrow, and the numbers were enormous. 0.05% of all nucleated cells were making hemagglutinin antibody. That's higher than any progenitor cell in the bone marrow. It's an enormous number. But we had another question, which is, is the antibody response any good? Some vaccines are great at making antibodies, but they're not good at making neutralizing antibodies that are protective. So in the influenza field, there's 18 different subtypes of influenza A, and typically two of influenza B. And the main ones that infect people and that you get vaccinated with currently are H1N1 and H3N2s. But there's many different families, and these families reside in different animal species. So avian influenza, which can possibly cross over into humans, and it, it occurs all the time, versus pig influenzas, which crossed over in 2009. The current H1N1 was a pig influenza. Th these are new pandemic viruses that cross over from animals and change the world of influenza. So they're always a fear. Every year we guess what the influenza is going to be, and sometimes we're right and you get decent protection, but none of these vaccines protect against a pandemic crossover virus that it can appear at any time. So what we did is we took these animals and we, they were immunized with an H1, and we challenged them with a very distant H5. It shares about 60% homology with the vaccine. And we challenged these animals that had been immunized with an H1HA, and they were completely protected. So this told us not only were we making enormous antibody titers, but we were making enormous neutralization and protection titers. So these vaccines are now in phase one clinical trials in people being developed as universal influenza vaccines. These are vaccines that will prevent infection from mutated virus, from crossover viruses, from birds or pigs or any source possible. And it's the hope for the future 
instead of having to make a new vaccine every year, we make a universal vaccine and it protects people for 10 or 20 or some unknown number of years. But as an immunologist, I had a problem. Our vaccine did not make sense. And the issue was, Katie showed you that nucleoside-modified mRNA has no adjuvant activity. It doesn't induce any inflammatory cytokines. Vaccines require adjuvant. Adjuvants stimulate the immune system and say, hey, this is a foreign antigen, you need to do something. As far as we could see, there was no adjuvant in this vaccine. The lipid nanoparticles had not been described as binding any adjuvant-stimulating receptors. So we were confused. Typically, most vaccines have an adjuvant. They say, oh, they're Th1, Th2 biased. Doesn't matter, they're both inflammatory. But there are many different types of CD4 helper cells. And we focused in on one particular type known as T follicular helper cells. T follicular helper cells, and this brings us back to the germinal center B cells, they're required to form a germinal center. And in the germinal center, they supply help to the germinal center B cells to get them to affinity mature, to get them to mature and become isotype switched, long-lived plasma cells, long-lived memory cells. So without TFHs, T follicular helper cells, you get a poor antibody response. So we investigated, was this vaccine somehow inducing TFHs in an under, previously undescribed adjuvant activity. So we turned to the monkey model, and we did this because we could measure antigen-specific TFHs. And it also allowed us to do something else. We compared the RNA LNP vaccine to a standard protein vaccine with a very potent TFH-inducing adjuvant, double-stranded RNA. We measured TFHs, both total and antigen-specific, and as you can see, the mRNA LNPs just blew the double-stranded RNA out of the park. We went back and calculated, on average, most adjuvants, alum, MF59, uh, others, double-stranded RNA, about 5% of the CD4 helper cells are TFH phenotypes. The rest are Th1, Th2, other types. With mRNA LNPs, over 50% of the CD4 helpers are T follicular helper cells. So we had enormous induction of these critically important CD4 helper cells and that's the reason why we get such potent antibody titers with the COVID-19 vaccines. The titer of antibodies with these vaccines is typically three to five times higher than what you get after infection with COVID-19. And that's rare to have a vaccine that works much better than live virus or live uh, pathogen infection. So it, this gave us the mechanism for why we got such potent immune responses. The next question we investigated was that, what about the LNPs or the RNA was responsible? So we did a simple experiment. We took empty LNPs and mixed them with protein antigen. Other people use alum or MF59 or a variety of their adjuvants. We asked, could LNPs be the adjuvant? And that's exactly what we saw. When we mixed the LNP, empty LNP with the protein, we got high levels of T follicular helper cells and high levels of antibody production. So it turns out that the LNP is an adjuvant it's just not a typical adjuvant. We looked at what kind of cytokines the LNP induced, and it didn't induce typical 
cytokines, which are usually type 1 interferons. It induced IL-6. IL-6 is a potent stimulus for T follicular helper cells. So the, the story started to come together that the LNPs are a potent adjuvant that induce T follicular helper cells in part through IL-6 induction and by a lack of type 1 interferon induction. With that, we wanted to work on better vaccines. And we've taken a number of approaches. We've developed probably close to 30 different vaccines. I'm working with a couple researchers at Karolinska right now to develop different vaccines. But we tried something unusual that we figured nobody else in the world would try because we were crazy and people knew that. Uh, we made a vaccine where we took one HA from every subtype of influenza. So that's a vaccine that has 20 different RNAs mixed together. And nobody believed it would work, and I didn't believe it would work, but I did it anyway. But when we put this vaccine into animals, in both mice and ferrets, this is what happens when you put in only H1HA. You get a very potent antibody response to H1. You get a little bit of cross-reactivity to group 1HAs, and you get nothing to group 2. When we put all 20 HA RNAs together, we got equal antibody responses to every single protein. This surprised us first because we were getting 20 antigen responses in a vaccine, and there was no antigen dominance. And the critical fear of, of multi-component vaccines is one antigen will dominate and the others won't respond. We've done this with a couple of different RNA vaccines. We've never seen antigen dominance. We get a good response to all 20 uh, HAs. So I only say this when pharmaceutical execs aren't in the audience. But in theory, I could see a day when we bring our children to the pediatrician for their every three-month vaccination. And instead of going at one month, three, six, 12, 16, 18, 24, uh, up until they're 18 years old, we could be giving kids one immunization of RNA at one month, six months, two years, and be done. And instead of getting 20 vaccines per year for a number of years, they could get a few would greatly simplify parents' lives, would drive pharmaceutical execs insane because they would lose all the vaccines they were producing. I don't know if it'll ever happen, but we can dream about it. So we developed a new vaccine platform that we could encode just about any antigen. We could put as many antigens in as we wanted. We've done 20. We've got a vaccine with 75 going right now. I'll let you know if that works. Uh, it gave incredibly potent antibody responses. And the two mechanisms were first, Katie showed long-lived protein production. We see protein production for up to 10 days. Immune systems like that because you're constantly loading the immune system with antigen and a specific induction of T follicular helper cells that drives the antibody responses. Now, I, I, I would often be asked questions at, at talks like this. If you look at the personalized cancer vaccines that Moderna and BioNTech are doing right now, and they both reported great results in melanoma and good results in pancreatic cancer, People ask, well, what's the difference between these two vaccines? The principal difference is BioNTech uses unmodified RNA, and Moderna uses nucleoside-modified mRNA. But the other critical difference is 
Moderna uses lipid nanoparticles like the COVID-19 vaccine, and BioNTech uses a lipoplex, which is a lipid shell with an aqueous interior. That lipoplex has no adjuvant activity. So they use unmodified RNA to supply adjuvant to their vaccine. Moderna uses the LNP adjuvant activity. When you compare these two together, we asked who makes better T cell responses? And we compared using LNPs, 100% modified gave decent T cell responses, but unmodified gave much better, much more potent. And that's why the unmodified likely work better in cancer vaccines. The problem is, is when you make this number of T cells with unmodified RNA, you don't make good antibody responses. And that's why the clinical trial failed. We tried this in a monkey model for an HIV vaccine. And we again mixed different concentrations of modified and unmodified mRNAs. And we saw the same thing. 100% modified gave relatively low T cell responses. As you increase the modification, you increase the amount of T cell response. We compared that to a chimp adeno vaccine. This is similar to what Oxford developed. The responses for the chimp adeno were actually a little bit lower, but statistically they're about the same. So it tells you that depending on how you make the mRNA vaccine, you can change the characteristics. You can change the amount of antibody or the amount of T cell responses. To address this, we tried a different approach. We asked, could we add cytokine adjuvants to change the vaccine? And in this case, we're looking at IL-12. IL-12 is a potent T cell inducing cytokine. And we did a simple experiment. We took a microgram of ovalbumin encoding RNA and mixed it with a microgram of either empty or IL-12 containing uh, RNAs and put them into mice that had a thousand CD8 T cells that had a T cell receptor for ovalbumin. So these weren't naive mice, but they only had a thousand antigen specific cells. So we could easily measure their expansion. The addition of IL 12 enormously, about tenfold, increased the activation and expansion of the CD8 positive T cells. They were present everywhere in the spleen and lymph nodes. And interestingly, they were effector T cells. IL-12 induces effector T cells. So you can see here the KLRG1 positive, 127 negative, those are effectors. Memories are 127 positive, KLRG1 negative. So we greatly expanded the number of effector T cells without affecting memory T cells. We're using this now for new types of cancer vaccines that will be used in patients who have genetic deficiencies associated with cancer. BRCA is the, the most commonly one known. Uh, but the idea here is that you treat people before they develop cancer. Uh, we know that it's five or 10 years that cancer cells first start to appear before you've got full-fledged large tumors that impair function. If we treat these people maybe every five years with a vaccine that only makes effector T cells, will clean out, clear away, kill all of the transformed cells uh, and maybe completely prevent cancer from ever appearing in these patients. Another critically important thing is that adding IL-12, unlike unmodified RNA, doesn't lower and actually improves the antibody response. So this is with IL-12 addition. It's about over half a log higher 
antibody titers. So now we've made a vaccine that gives better T cell responses and better antibody responses. At Penn, we've got a bunch of different vaccines in clinical development. These include many different pathogens, including malaria, TB, HIV, HCV. We have vaccines for food allergies, like peanut allergies, have vaccines for environmental allergens, like dust mites, and we've got a number of vaccines for autoimmune diseases that are all in development. Katie showed that already, so I can jump ahead. What I wanted to next talk to you about is what I see as the future of mRNA therapeutics. So if you ask anybody who develops nucleic acid or viral therapeutics, the biggest problem is targeting. It's getting the nucleic acid or the virus to the cells of interest. Lipid nanoparticles go to the liver. They also go to dendritic cells that makes them a good vaccine. But what if you wanted to send them to the heart or the brain or the lung or the bone marrow? They don't go there. So we developed a way of targeting lipid nanoparticles by adding targeting molecules to the surface. Uh, it's a little complicated chemistry that I don't need to go into, but we essentially add any targeting molecule to a PEG lipid that sits in the lipid nanoparticle. It doesn't change the morphology of the lipid nanoparticles. It makes them a little bit bigger. The surface charge remains the same. So all of those are critical. Most importantly, it doesn't impair function. So these, are in, in red, these are PCAM expressing cells, and the LNPs are labeled with an anti-PCAM antibody, and they bind very well. They make luciferase. When we add them to endothelial cells, only when you add PCAM, the endothelial cells take up the LNPs and make the RNA. So not only can they target, but they're functional. We injected these into a mouse and then analyzed where the activity was. So in the absence of targeting, all the activity is in the liver. When they're PCAM targeted, we've switched activity to the lungs. And there's about equal amounts of activity in the lungs. So we switched where these LNPs are targeted to. And here we can efficiently deliver to lungs. As an immunologist, I had an interest in modifying immune cells. T cells in particular were interesting. They could be modified in a variety of ways. You could deliver antigen to them as a vaccine. You could deliver cytokines to change their function. You can deliver CAR molecules to kill tumor cells. The, the list goes on and on. But there's a difficulty with T cells. They don't have endocytic activity. So what that means is that they're unable to take up nucleic acid particles. Our idea was we could combine targeting with getting into the cell by targeting a molecule that endocytoses after it's bound. And that's exactly what we saw. When we added targeted LNPs to purified CD4 positive T cells, in the absence of targeting, we had no uptake. With targeting, we had very high levels. So not only did we bind the cell, but we allowed the cell to take up the LNPs and translate the mRNA. We injected these into animals. We saw an increase in spleen activity with targeting. The spleen has about 20% CD4 positive T cells in them. But we, we did something interesting. We re-imaged the animals after we removed all of the organs on the previous slide. And when we did that, 
all of a sudden lymph nodes lit up. These are paraortic and inguinal lymph nodes. So what this means is that we gave lipid nanoparticles targeted to CD4 T cells intravenously into the circulation. They escaped from the circulation, went into the tissues, into the draining lymphatics, back to the draining lymph nodes, where they targeted CD4 positive T cells, were able to be taken up, and the RNA was translated. So we could complete that entire process. Here we purified the CD4s and show that the activity is there. So we were able to deliver nucleic acid therapeutics to a particular cell type in vivo. We use the model system known as the Cree lock system. What that involves is you put a stop codon in front of a fluorescent protein, and you put what are known as locks P sites, specific DNA sequences, and then you deliver a Cree recombinase mRNA. The Cree recombinase cuts out the stop codon, and it makes the cells express the fluorescent protein. When we did that, we saw enormous levels of fluorescent protein in both splenocytes and lymph nodes. This is the fluorescent protein expression. There's almost nothing without targeting, very high levels with targeting. But from an HIV point of view, there was something more important. This axis is an activation marker. HIV forms latency in unactivated resting CD4 positive T cells. So if you're delivering a therapeutic for HIV, it has to target, be taken up, and be translated in resting cells. And that's exactly what we saw here. The resting cells had equal levels of gene recombination. So this is now in a macaque experiment looking to cut HIV out of the genome of latently infected cells. We saw very high levels of gene recombination, both in spleen and lymph node. We've looked at a variety of other tissues and see the same thing. So our conclusions were that we could figure out how to target specific cell types in vivo. We then went on to test another model system. So if you come from Penn, Penn clinically developed CAR T cells. The first clinical trials were done there. The first two drugs were FDA approved at Penn. So Penn has a close relationship to CAR T cells. What a CAR T cell is, it's an altered CD8 killer cell. So CD8 killer cells recognize a peptide derived from a virally infected or oncogenic cell in association with the host MHC. They're very effective at killing. The problem is, is just about everybody in this room has a different peptide and many different MHCs, so they're not translatable from one person to the next. What a CAR T cell does is it puts a piece of an antibody that recognizes a tumor-associated antigen on the surface of the T cell. That way, you can make killer T cells that kill any tumor or any cell with that antigen. CD19 was the first one to be developed. The problem with CAR T cells, this is what it takes to make a CAR T cell. You start with a patient. You leukophorese the patient. That's a machine that has a centrifuge in it that spins their blood, takes out the white cells, gives everything back. It does that over and over and over, over a few hours, and it takes out a couple billion T cells. You then have to infect those T cells with lentiviruses in culture. You then have to stimulate them for 10 days to expand how many there are and then you can give those back to the patient. And then about 70% of the time, they kill the tumor and cure the patient. The problem is, is it costs half a million dollars a dose because it's 10 days in a very fancy lab 
uh, under GMP conditions. Uh, these sites are available in, in the US and in Europe. There's one in China. There's, I think, one in South America. There is none in Sub-Saharan Africa. So they're very limited in where they are because of the cost and the expertise needed to do it. We had the idea, since we can now target cells in vivo, could we make CAR T cells in vivo? And the thought was, well, if we targeted the LNP to bind to all T cells, and then we put a CAR molecule in the mRNA, the, T, the LNPs would be taken up by the T cells, the RNA would be translated, and they'd put the CAR on the surface of the T cell. We chose a CAR that recognized activated fibroblasts and a model of cardiac fibrosis. So I apologize for the echocardiography readings, but what you need to realize is the gray are normal animals, and these are just different measures of heart function. As a, 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 an internist, this is what I look at. This is how much blood is pumped out by the heart. So in a normal heart, it's about 70% of the blood is pumped out. When a heart becomes fibrotic due to hypertension, that reduces. And the lower it, it goes, the worse off the patient is. We treated these mice with a single dose of LNPs that targeted T cells, and we returned their heart function to normal. Their ejection fractions returned to normal, the size of their ventricles, everything returned to normal. We stained the heart muscle for fibrosis. The normal animals, you see very little. The fibrotic animals, you see all this red fibrosis. One treatment with LNPs essentially cured these animals. So instead of a half a million dollars, 10 days, specialized facilities, now it can be an off-the-shelf off drug. Somebody comes in with cardiac fibrosis. Heart disease is the number one killer in the world. They get an injection. They go home. Their heart is better. This can also be expanded to many other diseases and many other applications. The other thing I wanted to tell you about is bone marrow stem cell targeting. And to me, this is one of the most critical applications for RNA LNPs. Currently, there are thousands of genetic diseases of the bone marrow. These include all of the immune deficiencies, SCID, uh, they include the thalassemias, and most importantly, it includes sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia has 300,000 people a year are born with the disease. They're mainly in sub-Saharan Africa, but they're present throughout the world. In the US, they're about to approve, uh, FDA approve a gene therapy for sickle cell. The problem is, is it costs about a million to four million dollars per person. You multiply a million times 300,000 that bankrupts the world. So we need better ways of treating genetic diseases of the bone marrow. The problem with bone marrow stem cells are their rarity. So this is the number of cells in the bone marrow of a mouse. This is the number of repopulating bone marrow stem cells. It, it's a tiny fraction. So hitting those rare cells is very difficult. But we took the same approach that we did for CD4. We, in this case, we used a marker known as CD117 or C-Kit. With a single treatment of mice, and we're delivering a fluorescent protein, we were able to hit about 90% of bone marrow stem cells. Incredibly efficient. We went back to that Cree lox mice, and we followed them over time. So the animals got a single treatment here, and then we followed their blood over time, looking for a fluorescent protein from the Cree enzyme. 
After a few weeks, 100% of the red cells, white cells, and granulocytes were fluorescent. So we had 100% efficiency of gene editing the bone marrow of these mice. Now, for stem cell transplant people, they only believe stem cell results if you do a secondary transplant. What that means is you take the bone marrow from these mice and you take it out, you irradiate a new group of mice to kill their bone marrows, and then you put the new bone marrow cells in. When we did that, within a couple of weeks, 100% of red cells, white cells, and granulocytes were all gene edited. That meant we had 100% efficiency at gene editing bone marrow stem cells in vivo. Now, that, that's critical for certain diseases. For, for diseases like skid uh, and other immune deficiencies, if you fix half a percent of the stem cells, you cure the disease. But for sickle cell anemia, you have to fix 25% of all of the repopulating bone marrow stem cells. So with an efficiency of 100% targeting, then however well we can gene edit will likely give us potentials for cure. This is now a cure where we can line people up on the street, give them a single injection of RNA LNPs, and cure their disease. No million dollars, no fancy lab facilities, just off-the-shelf injections. It can also be used for a variety of other things. We do bone marrow transplants for a number of different types of cancer. You give people high doses of chemotherapy and sometimes radiation to prepare them for this. There's a mortality rate of around 5% from that treatment. Now we can deliver toxic genes to bone marrow stem cells and selectively kill them. Mortality will be much, much lower. We can deliver therapeutic proteins to stimulate granulocytes or platelets or other needed cell types. We can deliver really any kind of protein. We're also able to target a variety of other cells and tissues. We can target brain. Katie talked about treating strokes. We're now setting up to do studies on large animals, delivering therapeutic proteins targeted to the brain. We can deliver to the heart. We can deliver to lungs. We can deliver to T cells. We can deliver to any immune cell. We continue to expand what we can target. So in theory, someday, gene therapy might be as simple as walking into a doctor's office having them take a vial out of the fridge, injecting it into a person, and curing the disease. RNA therapeutics has enormous potential for vaccines, for genetic diseases, for therapeutic protein delivery, for the treatment of a variety of diseases. I, I joke with my lab people, we haven't thought of everything that we can do with RNA, and that's their job. I, I'm, I've done my job. Um, but I, I, the future of RNA, I think, is really going to be enormous. So I need to thank all of the people involved. Of course, Katie, who I started all of this work. Norbert Pardee and Hamida Parhees in my lab were the leaders for vaccines and targeting technology. People from Acuitas Therapeutics made the lipid nanoparticles. Vlad Muzikantov's lab developed the targeting technology that we use for all of our in vivo targeting. I have to mention John Epstein because he's the CSO of my university. Um, and uh, the many other labs that we've worked for. Thank you very much.
The lecture is now over. Please exit the same door that you entered. A short photo session will now begin. Уважаемый господин президент, дорогие друзья, очень рад вас видеть в Москве. Хеле хошхалем джинабалиро дар Москва бебина. Вчера, знаете, я был в регионе в соседнем. Амин дороги, дар район Хастин, ман дар ман тагай хамсавиима будам. Коллегам прямо прилетал на территории вашей страны. И хотел вообще приземлиться и прямо в, в Тегеране встретиться, но мне говорят уже президент собрался улетает в Москву. А с кем я там, кем бар Харим Хавои, Джомури Ислами Иран, Харвас Кельдам. Ва ворон там айол даштам, хамунжо форуд бокона, безамин беши нам, варе анки бажна бали молават бокона. Вали биман хабар дам, ке ходе бажна бали там айол даран, бе Москва сафар намоит. Вот у нас отношения развиваются очень хорошо. Рабабете, до кешвары мун, бе хуби тусе миябат. Пожалуйста, передайте самые наилучшие пожелания. Маунджебе, эмтенар, хадбуд, чинанче, хедмате, магаме муазаме рахбари, бехтайна резухоро, бересуни. Благодаря его поддержке у нас набрана хорошая динамика за последние годы. چون ایشون از روابط ما حمایت میکنند ما واقعا خویایی توسعه روابط مون رو داریم. В прошлом году товарооборот вырос на 20% до сих хороших результатов вот это. Свыше 5 миллиардов у нас. Мы вышли на 5 миллиардов. شایان ذکر شد که در سال گذشته حجم مبادله کالا حجم تجارت بین دو کشورمون رشد 20 درصدی را نشون داد این یک نتیجه خوبیه вот мне сейчас коллеги только рассказывали они рано были да у нас как они назывались была выставка 4 по 7 октября с 4 по 7 октября у нас была выставка в Москве иранская выставка و حجم مدل کالایمون به میزان 5 میلیارد دلار رسیده و الان همکارانمون به من گفتند خبر دادند که الان یک نمایشگاه تو ایران برگزار شده بود در تاریخ های چهارم هفتم اکتبر این مسئله ودیویلی استامو کاکو اینتریس آنها ویزولا و روسیسکی چیست؟ و خودمون واقعا تاجا 